So we're in this series about get back and get back your momentum. And we live in a time where we need that. We need a time. How many of you know that as a church and as a nation and as our families, we're under attack and we need some wins in our life? And all God's people said, amen. We need that. We need that. We need some. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the message today, but I, but I do want to, I just kind of want to do a sidebar and, uh, and I, I kind of want to encourage us today, uh, today, uh, you know, we're, we're, we live in a nation. If you're, by the way, if you're 13 years old, if you're a 13 year old or under, you have never known America not in a war. You, you, you realize that? You've never known America. And I, and I know what people say, and they say, well, you know, uh, we had all the same kind of pressures that the young people had. No, no, you didn't. You didn't have, like, not like they do. You didn't have that. And why, and why people don't want to step up to the plate and minister to teenagers, and why they don't want to step up to the plate and minister to children, is beyond me. Because you've never, if you're a 13-year-old or younger in this church or in this nation, you've never known America not at war. And then now we're in, a, we're in another war. And it's nobody's really talking about it. Nobody's saying anything about it. And then this past week, we have a guy that comes in and goes into Moore, Oklahoma. I don't know if you've ever been to Moore, Oklahoma. Moore, Oklahoma probably has more Southern Baptist churches on every corner than any other city in America. Moore, Moore Oklahoma is the buckle of the Bible belt. And we have a guy go into a workplace and holler in jihad and beheads a woman. And our news organizations, they're calling it a workplace violence, a workplace violence. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, I am tired of us being under attack. I want to tell you something. If a Southern Baptist had done that, if there had been a Baptist man that had gone in and beheaded a woman in the name of Jesus, you better believe the news organizations would be all over that. You better believe. And I want to tell you something. If that had happened, every pastor I know, every pastor in the country that I know would get behind their pulpit on today and and decry that and say, let me tell you something. That's not Jesus. That is not us. Don't look at a guy like that. And we decry that. And I just want to know, and I just want to serve notice and you can write me and you can email me. You can Facebook. I don't care. Bottom line is I want to know all across America at any mosque and any Muslim and, and, and any sheik, are they decrying that kind of activity? I just want to know that because I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, we are at war in America and they say it's not a war like any other war. And they're absolutely right. This is a spiritual war. This is spiritual warfare. It is good against evil. It is right against wrong. It is Christ against antichrist. And you and I know it. So I just want you to do this. I just want somebody that'll be with me today. And I know I, you, this may be embarrassing to you and you may not like this and you may not even come back. But I just wonder, is there anybody today that would stand to their feet and give a mad hand clap the fact that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is alive? And Jesus is on the throne. Come on, guys. You can do better than that. You do better than that at a ball game, man. Anybody for Jesus today, give God praise and glory. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Woo. Okay. That's good. That's <laughs> You say, you're trying to start something. Yeah, you're right. I'm tired. I'm tired of losing. I, I, I'm tired. I'm tired of the culture of this world. I'm, I'm tired of this nation being at war. And our young people have to listen to war and have to listen about the rumors of war. I, I'm, I'm tired. We need, we need some wins. Can I, can I get an amen? And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how to get some wins in your life, how to get some momentum in your life. Not only in the life of your family, but the life of this church. I'm, I'm tired of this church losing. I'm tired of this church not baptizing any more than we baptize. I'm tired, I'm tired of auditoriums that are uh, half full. I, I'm, I'm tired of that. I, we, need, we need some wins. We got people dying and going, I'm, ti I'm tired of people that, that come here every Sunday and I love you and I'm so glad you're here, but you won't step up to the plate. You don't give. You don't serve. You don't have a ministry. You just come and say, feed me, preacher, feed me. Well, you're getting fat enough. Can you get an amen? Amen. It's time for you to step up to the plate. Now, I'm not fussing at you, but I'm just saying we need momentum. We need that forward movement. And that's what momentum is all about. And Elisha, 
I call it the master of momentum because he lived in a time when momentum could have been gone. He lived in a time when everybody could have said, you know what? Our best days are behind us. And don't you listen to the voice of the culture. Our best days are not behind us. If you read the end of the book, you know we win. But the bottom line is we're right on schedule. And so don't give into that. But Elisha lived in that time where he could have said, you know what? Our best days are behind us because the greatest man that outside of Moses that ever lived on the face of the planet, he's going away from us. And as a nation, we're going to be gone and we're going to be sunk. And so we're going to, we're going to live. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you last, last time, last week, we talked about how to gain momentum, how to, how to get momentum. If you, if you, if you've never had momentum, how to get momentum, if you have it, how to keep it. If you've never had it, how to, or if you had it, how to get it back. We talked about how to, how to gain momentum. But today I'm going to talk about the momentum of having God's favor in your life. Am I talking to anybody today that wants God's favor on your life? Am I talking to anybody today that wants the hand of God on you? Am I talking to anybody today that wants to be blessed of God? Say a big amen. 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 And I think we do, and I think all of you do. And I, and I think that's what, so how do we how do we get that? We we talked about we talked about, you know, the uh, the precepts of men and how to get it. Well, today I'm going to talk about the places you gotta to go to find it. Because if you want the hand of God in your life, and I want the hand of God in my life, let me tell you something. Listen, when I was on sabbatical, man, I just want you to know. I know I'm in my, I know I'm in the second half. I get that. I, I'm, I'm probably beyond, I'm probably in the fourth quarter. I don't know. I'm at least in the third quarter. I may be in the fourth quarter. I have no idea. I don't feel like it. I know I look like it, but I don't feel like it. Don't say amen right now. But anyway, I, I know I don't, I know I don't feel like it, but the bottom line, I don't know. But I'm in a place where I can say, you know, like other pastors my age, I'm going to go to all the retirement seminars and, you know, I'm going to make sure, you know, my retirement is set up and, and, and all of that, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel that way because I feel like I, we need. You know, I, I feel like more momentum than ever than in my life, and that's what I want. And so this really speaks to my heart, and I'm just going to share with you how it, how it speaks to my heart. But 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 in order to have that, if you want the favor of God on your life, if you want the hand of God on your life. There's some places you got to go. You're not going to get around it. I mean, God's just requiring that you got to go to these three places. Now, if you're not a note taker, I would suggest that you take notes. All right. Because this is, in this series, it's going to be very, very vital, very, very important. So let's take our Bibles, go to the book of 2 Kings in chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. And by the way, if you're on the U version of your Bible, we've kind of updated our live stream in this auditorium right now. And so you will find a better experience with U version. I know some people have been having some problems with that. So uh, thanks to Brent and, and his workers, we've kind of updated our live stream. So you should be able to get on a little bit better. If you've never downloaded U version, go to your Apple app or your, uh, you know, what? Whatever other app you got, go to Uversion. It's all there. And by the way, if you go to Uversion, you, 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 for days, I mean, I, I, I send the notes to, uh, to our secretaries. And so you can find out what I'm preaching several days ahead of time. But there's some notes, there's some questions there. You can follow along in your Bible as we read. And I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, but if you don't, just get, a, get, get the Word of God, get a copy of them. We've got Bibles right there in the seat in front of you. Because you don't know, I could be making this up as I go along. I want you to see it for yourself. I want you to study the Word of God for yourself. So, now, last time, we talked, we talked about how uh, Elisha uh, was plowing in a field. And uh, he's kind of minding his own business. And then Elijah, who is the most famous guy on the face of the planet at that time for the Jews, Elijah, the famous prophet, approaches Elisha and he says, you're going to follow me. And he takes his mantle, and which is just another word of saying robe or sash, and he places it on Elisha. And he said that what God has done in my life, he's going to do in your life. The, the power of God that's on me is going to be the power of God on you. And what you, you know, you're, you're going to follow me. And so you remember what happens? He doesn't understand fully, but that does not keep him from obeying immediately. You remember that? And so he, he leaves and he starts, begins to follow Elijah. Now keep in mind that where we pick it up in our scripture, 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, it's been 10 years, 10 long years. Everybody look up here just a minute. You've been praying for something for four years? Have you been praying something for five years? Have you been praying for something for 10 years? Maybe some have been praying something for 20 years. But, but, but listen, don't just don't give up because that's, that's going to be the key of what we're talking about. So it's been 10 long years since that day happened. And this whole time, Elisha has been in the background. 
He's seen Elijah work. He's been with Elijah, he's, you know, but, he, but, but it's not happened to him. And it's been 10 long years. And maybe, maybe something's in your life and it's been 10 years or longer or shorter. Maybe, maybe you're disappointed. You've been praying for 10 days and it hasn't happened yet. But, but, but it's been 10 years. And so we pick it up, 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning at uh, uh, verse 9. And so it was, and when they crossed over, and that's talking about the River Jordan, we're going to talk about that, that Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what can I do for you before I'm taken away from you? Now, everybody look up here a minute. Elijah knows he's getting ready to die. He knows he's getting ready to pass off the scene. Uh, and he doesn't know how dramatically this is going to happen, and we'll see this in just a moment, but he knows his, he knows his days are behind him. And so uh, he asked Elisha, he said, Elisha, before I leave, what, what, what do you want? What do you want God to do? What, what, what can I help you with? And listen to what Elisha said. Elisha said, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. A double portion. And so he said, you have asked for a hard thing. And I reckon so. And it was a hard thing. Because 14 major miracles have already been done by the hand of Elijah. 14 major miracles. And so, so Elisha said, you know what, whatever you got, I want a double portion. What do you got? And, and even Elijah said, well, you're asking for a hard thing. He said, nevertheless... If you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. In other words, everybody look at me. In other words, he said, if you're in place, if you're in place when this happens, it can happen to you. But the, but the key is you've got to be in place. The key is you can't be fly by night. The key is you can't be off and on and up and down. We got people on our rolls the CIA can't find. And all God's people say And so the key is, listen, listen, the key is for you not to take a ministry and then after two months, it doesn't work, you quit it. The, the key is not to say, well, I'm going to work with the young people. And you get in there and you find out it ain't that easy. And then you quit it. The, the key is not to go church hopping, go from church to church to church. That ain't going to get you nowhere. Because I promise you, you're looking for a perfect church. You join it, it won't be. Amen? I mean, you know, bottom line is, so, so the key is to stay where you are. The, the key is to stick it out. The key is to be in place. And this is what Elijah is telling Elisha. He said, Elisha, if you're in place, if you're faithful, then you can see it happen. And that's exactly what happens. And then he says, then, then, it, then it happened, verse 11. Then it happened as they continued and they talked and suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And then the Bible says, and he saw him no more. It was a bad day in your life, wasn't it? When God took that person that you love and you see them no more. It was a bad day. It's a loss of momentum when that happens. Maybe it's a mother or a father. Maybe it's a wife or a husband. Maybe it's a child. It's a bad day. When somebody that you love and God takes them and you see them no more. And I know a lot of people. That is such a momentum killer that they never regain that. I see a lot of people never recover from that. And that's not what God has in mind. God never has that in mind. And so it would have been easy for Elisha to say, well, it's over. It's over. My mentor's gone. My ministry's gone. Everything I know, everything I've enjoyed for the last 10 years, it's gone. The promises of God, all of it. Been easy for him to do that. Because when somebody you love is taken, it's a momentum killer. But that's not what he does. That's not what Elisha is all about. And then he said he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces. In other words, Elisha's really torn up about this. And he also took the cup or took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. And when, when Elijah's taken up into heaven... His mantle falls from him to the earth. And so Elijah had taken the, the, uh, the mantle that had fallen from him, and he went back, and he stood by the bank of the Jordan, and he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water, and he said, Where is the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elijah crossed over. One of the reasons why Elisha, is the master of momentum is because he knew it was one thing. Don't you listen to me? You listen to me? Say amen. Come on. All right. One of the things he knew, it was one thing to be appointed by God, but it's another thing altogether to be anointed by God. Now, that's good. That's better than you thought it was. 
It's one thing to be appointed by God. It's something altogether different to be anointed by God. I'm going to tell you something. If you're a blood-bought child of God today, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, if you're saved and on your way to heaven, however you want to label it or however you want to call it, if you're born again and you know that and Jesus is your Savior and your Lord and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you have been appointed by God. The reason why God didn't take you to heaven when he saved you, he left you down here for a purpose and he appointed you to do something for the cause of Christ. Do I have anybody that believes that today? But it's one thing to be appointed. Every one of you that are saved are appointed. But the question is, are you anointed? Are you anointed by God? You see, that's the momentum. That's, That's where the forward movement comes in. That, that keeps you off the up and down and in and out and off and on roller coaster that so many believers that I see are always on. Up one day, down the next. Starting something one day, quitting it the next. And so that keeps you off of that spiritual roller coaster. Because it's one thing to be appointed, it's another thing to be anointed. So we're not going to talk about how to get momentum today, but we are going to talk the places of where you find it. Where do you find momentum? Here, here they are, three places, very quickly. Number one, first of all, is the place of determination. The place of determination. Now, if you go back to verse one, you'll notice that there are three different places that Elisha is going, or Elijah is going, and he tells Elisha, don't go with me. I, I don't want you to go. There, there's, there's Gilgal, there's Bethel, and then there's Jordan. And in all three of those places, Elijah... Uh, says, don't go, don't, don't follow me. This is kind of a weird thing. Here, here's the, here's the, the, the master who has a disciple and, and he's telling the disciple, don't, don't follow me. That's kind of weird. I mean, whoever, who does that? But that's exactly what he does. But you'll notice that what Elisha says all three times, I said, I'm not going nowhere. Wherever you're going, I'm going. I mean, I'm not, you're, listen, you're, you're, I'm, I'm going to go where you are. You're not, I'm not going to stay behind. You know, he says, the Lord is my witness. God is my God. I'm going where you go. Just think about it. How many marriages could be saved in America if we had that philosophy? And all God's people say, I mean, how many marriages say, you know what? I'm I'm not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. We're just going to work this out, man. We're going to hash it out. We're going to, we're going to just have a double portion of Jesus on our life and your marriage could be salvaged. Amen. We, uh, Christine right here, our interpreter. She say, everybody say, hey, there you go. All right. She's, I'm embarrassing her right now. And she's telling this deaf that I'm embarrassing her. Okay. She has a precious daughter. And, uh, and so a, a, a couple of, a couple of months ago or about a month ago, I was over in the family life center after the service and, and her, and her, her daughter, her little daughter's name Cheyenne, a little Cheyenne, cute as she could be, ran up to me and said, pastor Jeff, you're coming to my birthday party. <laughs> and Chrissy and her, her husband, they, it was a party they didn't even know about. It was a party they hadn't even planned yet. In other words, me coming to her party was not the first time they heard about me coming to her party. That was the first time they'd heard about her having a party. So they looked at me and said, I guess we got to have a party now. I said, I guess you do. And I guess I got to come. So we had it yesterday. So we're over at Sonic, we're at Spring Lake, we're at Sonic, we're just having, we're having a good time. And, and so there's, there's, there's some couples there, there's some people there, there's a, there's a young married couple there. It's been coming to our church a little bit and we got to talking to them and they were looking at me and Phyllis and my wife was with me and, and come on, man, my wife looketh good, man, come on, she's, she's hot, man. You know, anyway, so, anyway, so my wife, you know, she's with me and, and so the couple said, well, how long, Pastor Jeff, how long have y'all been married? And we said, 41 years. They said, you've got to be kidding. I said, 41 years. They said, man, y'all don't look like you've been married 41 years. It is a smart, observant couple. Can I get an amen? I mean, it is just, they're awesome. 41 years. And I said, let me tell you the secret of 41 years. I said, do you not think that in 41 years, my wife has said, I'm leaving you. And I, every time she did, I said, okay, you can leave me, but I'm going with you. Can I get an amen? Amen. I'm going to go with you. Listen, that's what it takes. And that's what Elijah was doing. Elisha was saying, Elijah, you can go, with you, but I'm going with you. It is a place of determination. Let me, let me, let me just make a statement. I want to make a statement very quickly. Okay. The true test of discipleship. Now, all of you, all, all the people that wanted about discipleship, and, you know, let, let me give it to you. The true test of discipleship is not what it takes for you to start following Jesus, 
the true test of discipleship is what it takes to get you to stop following Jesus. Amen. amen. That was good. That's a whole lot. I'm preaching a whole lot better than y'all think. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, you know, the, the true test of discipleship is not what he gets to follow, to start following Jesus. Anybody can start well. We have all kinds of people to walk in the aisle, all kinds of people to get baptized. Anybody can start well. The true test is not what it takes to get you to start following Jesus, but the true test of discipleship, what is it going to take for you to stop following Jesus? And that's what Elijah, that's why Elisha is so blessed by God, because he ain't going to stop. He's going to be in his place. And, and, and God honors that, and, and, and God blesses that, you see. I don't know how much Jesus you have today. I really don't. But I'm telling you this. I want you to listen to me. You have as much Jesus today as you want. You have as much Jesus today as you want. You want more Jesus? You get more Jesus. You want, you want just to get by? You can get, just, Jesus will let you just get by. You just want to come and sit and say amen, close your Bible, never open it up until the next week, and you want to be entertained and all that, Jesus will let you get by with that. But I'm telling you, you want a double portion? You want God's hand on your life? You want God's favor in your life and in your marriage and in your finances and everything else? If you want it, you can have it. But you got to be determined, and you can't give in. And all God's people say, amen. that's right. Yeah. That's, that's good. That's right. I'll give you an unusual story in the book of Matthew. Chapter 15, Matthew, Matthew chapter 15. Now, we, we don't have time to turn because time's running out. But there, there's, this, there's this story in Matthew 15 where this, this, uh, this Canaanite woman comes to Jesus. Now, Can Canaanite women or Canaanites were considered Gentiles. They were not part of the Jews. They were not part of God's chosen. They, they, they didn't view them back then like that. And so this Canaanite woman falls at Jesus' feet now, and she begs Jesus' help. Because she believes Jesus can heal her demon-possessed daughter. Now, Jesus gives her an answer. I'm going to be honest with you. It doesn't sound anything like Jesus. Matter of fact, I don't even like that Jesus said this to her. It kind of embarrasses me on behalf of Jesus, to be honest with you. He says this. Uh, basically, what he's saying, he's saying, listen, lady. I've been called to go to the house of the Jews. You're a Gentile. Why should I waste my time giving crumbs to the dogs? Dude, that's severe. Jesus just called her a dog. How would you like for Jesus to call you a dog? Now, how, how, how much would you follow Jesus if that was the case? And that's exactly what he said. But you know what her answer was? Listen. Her answer was, well, Jesus, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's table. She said, all I'm asking for is a crumb. That's amazing. As a matter of fact, there's two, there's two terms for dogs here. Jesus used the uh, term for a pet. Uh, you know, like a little puppy, a little dog, a pet dog. She uses the harsher term for dog, like the mangy street dogs. And then Jesus looks at her and he says, woman, your faith is great. And he says, listen, whatever you want, I'll do for you. You know what that was? It was a test. It was a test. That's what Elijah is doing for Elisha. He says, it's a test. And don't you think for one moment that Jesus is not going to give the test to you. If you want to go further, if you want momentum in your life, you want to get back momentum in your life, you want to get momentum in your life, or you want to keep momentum in your life, you're going to have to go to the place of determination because God's going to give you a test. He's going to send somebody along your way, somebody you really like, somebody you want to hang out with and they don't know nothing about Jesus and they're going to stray you. Or, he's, or, or, or there's, going to be, there's going to be a clash of the culture. There's going to be some kind of clash in your own family. There's going to be some kind of clash with husband and wives and sons and daughters or somebody you work with or somebody, one of your neighbors. There's going to be a test, a test of what is it going to take to stop you from serving Jesus? I think it was Brad. Brad was telling me today uh, that he put a sign, and Brad, I'm not talking out of the term, I'm just, I want us to pray for you, but he put outside, that him and him and Kelly, Brad and Kelly, the two brothers, they own a business, they, they're awesome, they're, 
they, they, they're good. They, they cook like women. It's awesome. I mean, you know, so, you know, and, uh, but they put a sign out on their business about being Christians. He was just sharing with me before the service started. He said, you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe the kickback. You wouldn't believe the trouble people are trying to make for us because we put a sign out that we're children of God. And I looked at him and said, what are you going to do about it? You going to take it down? He said, I ain't taking it down. He said, I'm thinking about putting up another one. <laughs> Amen. I mean, you know, so, so what, what does it take? That's, that's the test. And it's going to be a test. How many of you know everybody don't like the fact that you go to church? Y'all do know that, right? There, there was a time in this country when you told everybody you went to church. Like, oh, okay, what church you go to? Well, I'm like, nah, nah, you go to church. What are you doing that for? It's going to be a test. Now, not only is it, not only is it a place of determination because, what, you know, the test is what's going to stop to follow Jesus. That's determination. But number two, there's the place or the place of difficulty. The place of difficulty. Now, if you're not willing to go to this place, you'll never know the favor in the hand of God. I will never know the favor in the hand of God. It's a place of difficulty. I'm telling you, serving the Lord is difficult. I don't know who ever told us that this was easy. It's difficult. You get tired. You get tired. You know, I, uh, you know, I'm amazed at some of the ministry that takes place around here. I, you know, if you, if, you, if you want a blessing, and I don't recommend this for everybody, but if you want a blessing, go, 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 see, go see Marcy and Jay and, and, and those ladies that minister to homeless. Uh, what you guys are doing every other Monday? Is that, is that what you guys are doing every other Monday? Is tomorrow night one of those? First and third Monday. Go, go, go see that. Go see, go, go, see, go see who they minister to. It ain't playtime. It ain't playtime. It ain't pretty. But the boldness, I mean, you know, somebody says, man, you know, Marcy and Jay, they're dogmatic. No, they're not. They're bull dogmatic. I love it. I mean, you know, that's, that's awesome. I'm going to tell you something. Best testimony I ever heard in my life. I heard last Monday night at CR. I did. And, as, and it's a CR, it's a lady that came to our CR. And I'm telling you, that CR men, ministry rescued that woman. Rescued her. Amen. Oh, she was, she was giving that testimony. And it was going down, down, down. Her life was going down, down, down. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, man, if my life was going in a spiral like that, I'd want to kill myself. That was her next step. The next thing out of her mouth is, I tried my best to kill myself. And then somebody told her about CR at Aaron Lake Baptist Church. Folks, I want to tell you something. There's some awesome stuff going on here you don't even hear about, and it's worth supporting. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. That's right. There it is. It is. I'm telling you, come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. It's awesome. It's awesome. And that lady, when she came into CR at Air Lake Baptist Church on a Monday night, she was rescued by people that loved her just like, because she said, nobody's going to love me. Nobody's going to love me like I am. Nobody's going to love me with what I've done. She walked in that door, man, they surrounded her with love. And then after she finished her testimony, like, what a dry, I was crying, everybody was crying, she was crying. And then I saw about eight or ten ladies just surround that woman with love. She lost her kid. She lost her son. And he was there that night. And he came forward. He said, I'm back with mama. Now, I don't know what we can do about this. They live right off of Cliffdale. They have no money. They have no car. They want to come to this church. They catch a bus. They have to catch a bus, and the bus drops them off right up here at the drugstore, and they have to walk to CR. If somebody lives near Cliffdale or if a small group, a small group could make arrangements, we'll, we'll give you their name. Uh, we, know, we know their name. It's a couple. They don't have a car. They don't have anything, but they want to come to Aaron Lake Baptist Church. We need to get them here. Can I get an amen? Amen? If somebody lives near that area, see me after church. Let, let's get them people here. They, 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 don't have, they can't afford a car. And, and, and you may want to give them a car, which would be awesome, but I'm not quite even sure they can even afford insurance on a car. All, 
all I'm saying is, is that if you're going to follow the Lord, if you're going to have to, if you're going to, you, you got to be determined. But but not only that, you you got to you got to. It's going to be difficult. It's not easy, and you get tired of it. And, and I know, and I know that I know that Marcy and them get tired of cooking for the homeless, and I know CR people get tired of, of doing it. I know Freedom Campus gets tired of setting up. You'd be so proud of Freedom Campus. You'd be so proud of those people, and those volunteers that get over there. They get up there early in the morning. The pipe and drape they have to put up, and and it's portable church. And you'd be so proud. And I know it gets. Uh, listen, they get they get about eight o'clock in the morning. They don't leave at two thirty, three o'clock in the afternoon, and it's just a handful of people. But you would never know that man. They're just so excited about everybody or anybody that shows up to that campus. And all God's people said, be so proud of them. But it's not easy and you want to quit. Jesus says, don't quit. Don't give up. Be in your place, man. Be in your place. I'm going to bless you. Elisha, if you're not in your place, if you quit... If you give up, it ain't going to happen. Well, the three places that they went to, Gilgal, Bethel, and Jordan. That's not a mistake. That's, that's by design. Because all three of those places at one time had the hand of God on those cities. But in Elisha's day, they'd lost it. they lost their influence. They'd, they'd given in. You know what they'd done? You know what Gilgal and Bethel and Jordan had done in Elisha's day? They'd given in to the culture. That's exactly what they did. They gave in to the religion of the culture. They gave in to the people of the culture. They were God's chosen people. They were supposed to be different. They were supposed to do things different. And the culture got to them. And they compromised. And they started worshiping other gods. And the favor and the hand of God fell off of those three cities. And that's why Elijah was going there to try to do something about it. And I'm just telling you, it's difficult to be a child of God. It's more difficult than it's ever been. And one of the things we have to fight is the culture. We have to fight, we have to fight all, all of the people that look down their noses at us and think we're crazies and think that, you know, that, 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 that we're, you know, a bunch of snake handlers or crazy people or whatever. Listen, it's not good for business anymore. People driving by our church and see our parking lot full, they just shake their head and say, man, them put pitiful, poor people that think they're serving God or believe in God and all that. You can't listen you're gonna have to fight the culture it is difficult to swim upstream but i'm telling you in the end you're gonna be glad you did and all god's people say that's right that's it you got to give in to the politically correctness of this crowd last week in canada and you know we just got a little border from canada to america you you do know that it's but in Canada, a Christian college is being told they can't study the Bible no more because the Bible is a hate book. You think that ain't coming? I don't know. Well, I pray it don't. But we have no promise it won't. I'm just saying it's hard to swim against the string. By the way, if you read it carefully... You'll notice that when Elisha and Elijah went into those towns, that there were disciples there. Elijah's own disciples, by the way, they were already in those cities. And they approached Elisha and they said, you know, Elisha, Elijah's going to die, don't you? Elijah's getting ready. To, Elijah's not long for this earth. You know, that's going to, you know, and you know what they were telling? They weren't telling that to encourage him. They were saying, Elisha. Our best days are behind us. You know that, don't you? You know you're wasting your time by following a prophet that's not long for this earth. You know that, don't you? And everywhere he went, they tried to get him to, to go back. They tried to get him to be discouraged. How many of you know this? Come on. I love you. I love you with all my heart. But how many, come on, let's be honest. How many of you know sometimes your greatest source of discouragement can come from fellow church people? Yeah. Amen? You know what I learned? Let me tell you. When God called me in 1974, New, Year, New Year's Eve, 1974, 
and I started New Year's Day, 1975. When God called me to that, I knew he was calling me to be a pastor. I, I knew that. I knew he was calling me to be a shepherd. The shepherd is sheep. And I thought, I had this visual image in my mind. Shepherd and sheep, it's going to be awesome, man. I'm going to be around people that love Jesus. I'm going to be around people that pray. You know, I had worked in the corporate world around people that cuss like sailors. I was going to get around people that pray. I was going to get around people that love Jesus. I was going to be able to work. I was going to get to go to church every single day of my life. And it was wonderful. I was going to shepherd the sheep. You know what I learned fast? Sheep bite. Can I get an amen? Amen? <laughs> right? Sheep bite. And they hurt. It's difficult. Then there's the place of identification. You can't get back to where you belong if you don't know who you belong to. You got to be identified. You can't be ashamed of Jesus. On every hand, we're telling, tone it down, tone it down. Any guys that pre preach like me, I know I'm a dinosaur. I get that. Now, I've, I've had people tell me, man, if you tone it down a little bit, you'd have a bigger crowd. I, that may be true. That probably is true. People don't like to be yelled at anymore. And it's kind of a generational thing to have, you know, barnstorming, snorting, sweating preachers that have a Ph.D., that's a Pentecostal hairdo. <laughs> but anyway, and so, you know, so <laughs> you, you'll get that a little while. Anyway, so, so, so the bottom line is you, 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 gotta, you, can't, you can't be ashamed of Jesus. You, don't, you can't get back to where you belong if you don't know who you belong to. You go back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, and, and, and here's what happens. Before Elijah leaves the earth, he gets one more miracle. And what happens? They get ready, him and Elijah get ready to cross the Jordan in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 8, now Elijah, Elijah took his mantle, that's his robe, he rolled it up and he struck the water, that's the river Jordan, and he divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. That sound familiar? It already happened twice. God did it for Moses in the Red Sea. It wasn't the Reed Sea. History Channel said it was the Reed Sea. Sea of reeds. And they said, and if it's the Sea of Reeds, it could have been nowhere because reeds don't grow in salt water. So it was just a little lake. It wasn't, it wasn't a sea at all. It's just called Reed Sea. It's just, you know. And I was told that when I was in school. When I, when I, was, when I was in college and I was earning my, my degree in biblical, uh, in, in religion. I have a degree in religion in college. I have my master's and all that in biblical studies. But when I was in college and I was getting my degree in religion, I had a professor say, there's a, hey, all you Sunday school guys, it was the Reed Sea, it wasn't the Red Sea. And there wasn't a big major miracle anyway. And I raised my hand. I said, man, praise God. What a great miracle. He said, you didn't listen to me. I told you it wasn't a great miracle. I said, oh, yeah, it was how God drowned all those people in that little bit of water. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, so the bottom line is, you know, you, 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 got, you, you got God dividing the Red Sea. And he, did, and he did it for Moses and he did it for Joshua. You remember that? You remember that God parted the Jordan for Joshua? Now he does it for Elijah. He parts the Jordan. And Elisha and Elijah walk along dry ground. God's done that before. And it's amazing. But look what look, the three great heroes of the faith. But you know what Elisha is saying? Elisha is saying, you know what, God, if you did that for them, can you not do that for me? God, God if, if, if they can see your power like that, what about me? Lord, Lord, are they, are they just so special? I can't, I can't have you in my life like they did. Listen to what he did. Verse 14. Then he, Elisha, took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water. And he said, where's the God of Elijah? And he struck the water. In other words, he said, God, what you did for them, I want you to do for me. God, the miracles you've done for them, I want you to do for me. And we get so settled. And we, and we think that God has done what everything, everything he's going to do. He's done it in the past. I want to tell you something. You cannot get today's momentum by yesterday's memories. Now, now, let me say that again. Once again, that was a lot better than you think it was, all right? You cannot get today's momentum by living in yesterday's memories. Well, I wish it was the way it used to be. So do I. I wish the church was the way it used to be. So do I. I wish Aaron Lake Baptist Church was the way it used to be. So do I. Most of you don't even know how it used to be. I know how it used to be. I've been here longer than probably anybody. So do I. 
I wish raising children was the way it used to be. I wish television was the way it used to be. You had two channels. That was it. Two channels. You know, well, three. They added ABC. And you had, I mean, you, you had your choice. Beverly Hillbillies, Andy Griffith, Brady Bunch. Nothing wrong with that. Pretty cool. Pretty awesome. Back then, you had to walk to the television to turn the channels. Can I get an amen? I mean, yeah, so, so I wish it would, yeah. But listen, it's not the way it used to be. We are at war, and we have been at war, and America is not the way it used to be. This generation is not. But ladies and gentlemen, listen, we got to get serious about reaching an unchurched generation. we got to get serious about connecting with couples that need help and crying for help or going to the wrong places for help. we got to get serious about creating environments that is welcoming, creating environments that's not so churchy, creating environments where they can say, you know what? I might could stay here. I might could like this. This is not what I've expected. We got to get serious about doing that because it's not the way it used to be. You can't do church the way it used to be. But let me tell you what is what used to be. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody give God some praise and glory about that. Amen. And all God's people said. That never changes. That never changes. And so he said, listen. God, what you've done with them, I want you to do for me. And you notice he's not asking for a double portion to do miracles. Because Elisha knows that these things do not come by the hand of man. Elisha knew that everything that Elijah did came by the hand of God. And so Elisha is not saying, where's the miracles of God? He didn't do that. Because he's not wanting a double portion of miracles. He wants a double portion of the miracle worker. He cries out, where's the God of Elijah? Is it true? Or our best days behind us? Is America gone? Is the church of Jesus Christ in America, are we silent? Are we powerless? Do we have to sit in our corners, us four and no more? Everybody we invite, they don't want to come. Is that true? Everybody, nobody wants to come. Nobody wants to have any, nobody, really? Is that true? That's what Elijah was saying. Elijah was saying, where's the God of Elijah? Because we want to go forward. And don't tell me, God, this is it. This is all there is. By the way, let me say this. Each time that God parted the waters, it was significant. When Moses, when God parted the waters for Moses, when God parted the waters for Joshua, when God parted the waters for Elijah, and when God parted the waters for Elisha, it symbolized something. And it's what it symbolized every single time. Now, I know we have gospel songs that talk about crossing the Jordan and going into heaven. That is not what crossing the Jordan ever meant. Crossing the Jordan had nothing to do with going to heaven. Because every single time when they crossed the Jordan, they had to fight battles. How many of you are so glad that in heaven, you lay your battles down. Amen? But the bottom line is, crossing the Jordan always meant one thing, and this was this. It always meant leaving the past behind and dying to yourself. That's what it always meant. Leave your past behind. When, when Moses was standing there, God said, Moses, leave your past behind. Get out of Egypt. Leave it behind. When Joshua did, he said, Joshua, leave your past behind. Leave it behind. Don't worry about the 40 years of wandering with us. Those days are over. Leave it behind. When Elijah he said, Elijah, listen, it's time to cross the Lord. Leave it behind. Give it to somebody else. Your time is over. When Elisha did, he said, leave it behind. Die to yourself. Die to what you want. Die to your agenda. Die. If you want the hand of God, you're going to have to die to all that and identify with Jesus and not be ashamed of him and live for him. And all God's people said,